We'll move right into reports with Mr. Brooks, Superintendent of Schools. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming mm -hmm. tonight, Board. Welcome and Happy New Year. A couple of quick updates. Um, the, uh, we have uh, the New York State Comptroller uh, his office is in our school district for the next few months conducting a routine audit. He says that this is a typical one that's done about every six to eight years or so, and uh, we won the lottery this month, so we get started on it. And he showed up this week to begin his work. Uh, Board of Education got an email today, a second one from him today also, uh, so that there's some awareness as far as the scope of the project. and. And we anxiously watch and wait to see uh, how he goes through his process and methodologies and then the outcome and report at the end. So we look forward to it. These are usually opportunities for us also to see as a system where we can grow and fine tune some of our process procedures. So it's, it's never a bad thing. So. Um, also want to let the board know that I'm going to be presenting to the policy committee an update to the immunization policy. You know that this year um, there were changes to the immunization laws in New York State. Um, we also need to make some updates to our policy to reflect that. Um, so we will um, make those modifications to the policy committee for review. And then once they finish it, we'll bring it out to the board for a uh, uh, um, consideration. Um, and with that, I have nothing else to report. Okay. We do not have an Ulster Boses report, so we will move to Orange Ulster Boses. They don't have a meeting in January. February is the next. Okay, and we have no student representative report this evening. Um, so we will move right into the special, special education report with Robin Hecht and Megan Febby. Thank you. Okay, good evening. We're going to um, start with a brief introduction uh, of the author who wrote the report that you have all received and read and that we'll be reporting on. So, John McGuire. Thank you, Robin. Good evening, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Brooks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here in Marlboro. Um, we enjoyed, my colleagues and I, very much our, our work here in the district. and. Uh, it's good to see uh, old friends again. Um, we at Futures are uh, happy to uh, report that we have partnered now with well over 300 school districts around the country, including more than 50 here in New York State. Um, and so we, uh, we value uh, the opportunity to partner with districts of your caliber. Um, the, uh, the joy of our work is that we interface with some pretty terrific educators. When you think about the types of leaders who invite in a third party and say, we'll open the doors, open the files, grant you access, look at everything and tell us what you see, you're talking about people who have uh, a degree of courage and risk taking in their leadership and also people who have an obvious commitment to excellence. So that's our good fortune. Um, the other great joy of our work is that our partner districts, by and large, take the work seriously and follow up on it subsequent to the analysis. And I'm excited that uh, you're going to hear a report shortly uh, that dramatically and tangibly evidences that kind of commitment. Uh, so my role here tonight is not so much to present. I know you've had the report and had an opportunity to review it. I'm simply here to try and respond to any questions or comments you may have. I'll do my best. I'm a program guy, I'm an old retired superintendent, former director of special education and former special ed teacher. Um, but if you have any technical questions that I am not responsive to, uh, I will promise to get you that answer from our experts back at Futures. So with that, um, I'm happy to hear any questions you may have. I, I just had a question. Um, Sure. For some reason, when we, uh, when we have the recording on, those two microphones don't pick up well if you don't have them very close to you. So 
Pull them as close to you as possible. <laughs> My big mouth, I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> when we um, doing the reports, I was going through, I really appreciated the ones that, um, when, that you, you had um, figures that brought in other school districts besides Ulster County. Yes. We tend to um, look at ourselves more at Orange County than Ulster County. Uh -huh. um, and I would have liked to have seen some more comparisons in Ulster County rather than just, I mean, Orange County and then Ulster County, uh -huh. especially since we're a wealthier school district than most of Ulster. Um, right. I think we would be better suited compared to um, Orange County. Okay. And I would have liked to have seen that because I, I really did, we, based on Ulster County, we fit right where we were at, but I would really like to see where we compare with um, in Orange County, especially since most of our salaries are Orange County salaries, our contracts are Orange County salaries, um, and when we talk and we meet and we compare ourselves, we're part of Orange Ulster BOCES, not Ulster BOCES, but we compare ourselves to Orange County schools. So it, it, that, that's what I, I would have liked to have seen. I really appreciated the ones where you brought in Monroe Woodbury, right. you brought in some Dutchess County, you brought in some Rockland County. That actually gave me perspective, um, yep. and as a numbers person, I would have liked to have seen some from um, Orange County. That's good information. I'll pass that along. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, well, I had some questions because I noticed you interviewed only a certain number of people. Right. And I was wondering why. We have quite uh, a few special ed mm. teachers, paraprofessionals, OTPT, speech. Um, so being a, a, an advocate that I used to be as a parent member. Right. Um, it kind of like did not look like we're getting a full report on um, our, our special ed here. Our methodology is, is quite standardized with flexibility, I would say. Um, we ask for a minimum um, at each building. Our commitment, whether the district has three schools or 53 schools, we commit to visiting each of the schools. And we ask that um, typically principals select a, a diverse group that includes two special ed teachers, a gen ed teacher, uh, two paraprofessionals, the RTI point person, and the building administrator if there is an assistant principal as well as the principal. Um, that's, that's our minimum standard, we ask for that, and that has worked well for us in terms of the reason for the individual confidential interviews is somewhat unique to our methodology. We do, as, as you will appreciate, a lot of quantitative data analysis. We do that electronically and off-site, so we're not underfoot, frankly. Um, but we don't believe that that's sufficient. It's very fruitful, the quantitative data. But we believe in order to do the work credibly, it's important for us to get a sense of the climate and culture of the district and its individual schools. So that's why we do the individual interviews. That's why we guarantee confidentiality. So um, in terms of the numbers, we've had some of our partner districts specifically ask us to do beyond that number. We're happy to do that. Some districts ask us to interview parents, board members. Um, I can't recall if we've had a request to interview students. I don't believe so, Not, none that I've been involved with. Um, but I do recall one district in the, out in the Finger Lakes area where um, two of us went in, a team of two of us, and in two days we interviewed 84 people. I lost my voice on, my, on the second day. Um, but we, we respond basically, it's, it's um, what the district feels is uh, necessary. We do encourage districts, if someone indicates that they want to be interviewed, our position is always, you know, it's always better to include than to exclude. We don't want people to feel that we didn't want to hear them. But right, so I, I yeah. have, my, my other thing is, so you asked the principals to get you this, this special ed teachers. Correct. So of course they're going to give you the best of the best. Well, I, we so don't did, presume so that. We're very, me, we're very specific is, in, in indicating to them that we don't want all the cheerleaders. We want people who may um, have uh, some issues, may, may have some yeah. concerns they want to voice. Um, we look for a balance. And honestly, when we, when we go through the interviews, we see that we do get balance. We, we see people who, who have praise and, and yes. accolades. Uh, we also, we hear our share of concerns. We really do. And, and I, hopefully that's what helps balance 
remember, this is the context within which we're analyzing the quantitative data. So it helps when we do hear uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you will. Right. I just don't think that this is a just interview. It, it kind of like just upset me because you've only picked a handful of teachers. Right. And we have so many special ed teachers from life skills class teachers. Did you interview them? Were they up and being involved on how, from the kindergarten up, how they interact and how the behaviors in those classrooms are and how we deal with those behaviors? Mm -hmm. Did we interview those teachers? I can't answer or that. We, or we interview the, we interview the people that well, the that's district what I'm saying. selects. I mean, um, you know, we have a very diverse. The one, the yeah. one thing that we do urge districts not to do is not to have the special ed administrator select the staff uh, for, for obvious reasons. Okay. okay. Um, parent interviews. Were letters sent out to everybody? Like we have about 400 special ed parents. Yeah. So were they, um, were they selected by the district or were they done like a random sample? And I applaud the myth mixed methodology with uh, doing quantitative and qualitative because I think honest. that the, we don't make widgets and our kids, the, that whole, um, um, qualitative piece is really needed for our kids. So I, I think that those interviews are great. Yeah. Um, but I just was curious how we picked the parents, if it was a letter that went home to every special ed I'm parent. honestly not sure if it went to everyone. I'm okay. not sure how they were selected. Or we if it was like a random the, sample. We provide the template to our district partners and, and basically leave it to them. So um, in some good. districts, parents are interviewed and others not. Um, I'm not exactly sure how the parents were selected. So for us, so, Okay. None? If, if that answers your, I your question. I thought they said on here that there was parents interviewed. It said interview. in here that there was parents interviewed. There was interviewed. parents interviewed. Did it? Yeah. So where did we get the parents from? It was like on page five or six. Yeah. Folks, maybe okay. what we want to do is actually let them do the presentation. Okay. Yeah. And hold the questions for the end. Okay. Okay. All righty. All righty. Thank you. Well, that's not the report. Okay. Well, they need a chance to present the presentation, mm -hmm. and then we can have questions, right? Okay. Is that okay? There's a whole report um, that has a lot of information in it. So, okay, let's see. Absolutely. There's a, yes, that, that's why that we start with the presentation. It's a little short compared to, to this report. I think overall what's, what is being explained is there's a methodology to how they're going about it. So that's being explained. Now we're going to get into the details. I am a lefty, so. <laughs> the Wi Fi keeps going in and out. It's, it's I've had it and it's gone and it's back. So Megan and I did spend a great deal of time going through that entire report several times, several times. And what we did glean, because we wanted to understand the report and how it was, um, how it was looked at and what was looked at. So what we found in reviewing the report, that it was organized to cover two respectful areas, the organizational structure and the district coordination of the programs and services as one area and then the continuum of support services that did not leave out related services, the paraprofessional support, the out-of-district students, or any of those other areas. Those are all weaved within and overlap those areas. We found that in each area, there was findings or celebrations, outcomes, and opportunities for growth, which was where we focused most of our attention. You do see that, as in the report, the methodology. So we did, a, mm -hmm. it wasn't just the interviews, but the analysis of data that was in the district, documents, etc. So what we're going to really share with you tonight is the celebrations that we found in the report and then the areas of growth that 
as John has mentioned, we've already started to look at and examine and bring together committees and talk about. So Megan is going to talk about the celebrations. So the first thing that was reported in this, this study was the availability uh, ratio index. And what that did was it took the number of full-time equivalent employees in special education in each specialty area and compared it to the total number of students with disabilities that they would be able to work with in that area. The different things that were looked at were special education teachers, related service providers, and teaching assistants. And overall, the personnel ratios were within expectations for similar districts like Marlboro in New York State. Another takeaway that was positive was that parents truly are partners in the CSE process. And this may go to answer, I think, what you were talking about before with parents. Every year, we are required to report state information to the state. They're called indicators. And indicator eight is parental involvement. What it consists of is a survey, which is anonymous. The survey is given to all parents of students with disabilities. If you have more than one student with a disability, you'll receive that amount of surveys. It's completely anonymous, and you fill it out with what your experience with special education and services in the district are. It's submitted to an outside agency that reviews the surveys and then provides the information to the state. Last year, Marlboro was responsible for this indicator eight. However, the information hasn't been given back to us yet. So the last data we have to go on from indicator eight is from 2013. At that time, 82 parents responded, and overall, 88% of those parents reported that the district did facilitate involvement of them to improve the services for their child. Another celebration that we're currently doing really well in Marlboro is that the climate of CSC meetings are celebratory. What this means is that when a student is progressing and making progress, when we decrease or discontinue a service or even declassify a student from special, aid, special education, everyone is happy. And this is really what it truly should be. In special education, we're always working towards the least restrictive environment. We want our students included and to have as many experiences to be with typical and similar peers. So this is really a, a true positive. The other positive celebrations we take away from the continuum of supports. In the last five years, Marlboro's special education population has only grown 1%. And this truly is from the hard work that's done through the RTI process. All students have the ability to receive supports at the building level, going through the different tiers to receive services so that they don't need to be referred to special education. When a student does not make progress, then they are referred and those referrals are appropriate. It's pretty impressive that in five years, the po total population has only grown 1%. And when you compare this to the county average, it is still lower. Another takeaway of what Marlboro's doing well is that Futures found that the district is correctly identifying students with disabilities. What they did was they took the three highest incidence low needs disabilities. So those are the disabilities that are most common that you're gonna find but don't need the greatest amount of supports. Those classifications are learning disability, speech and language impairment, and other health impairment. Marlboro's constellation of these disabilities is 72% of our total population of students with disabilities. This is lower than the county, but also lower than the state. And what was found is that we're appropriately identifying these students. What's really important is that across the district, our students have equal access to special education services. When you look at our continuum, 
through our instructional program offerings, related services, or adult supports. You can have them in the elementary, middle, or high school. Talking about the high school, in the last four years, um, our students with disabilities have met our state target rate for graduation. Another positive takeaway is that when students turn 15, the year in which they turn 15, that IEP must have a transition plan. It's basically a roadmap of how we're going to get the student to be successful in what they want to do after graduation. The agency reviewed a series of IEPs of students that were older than 16, and all of the IEPs com com contained thorough, descriptive transition plans. The last takeaway I'd like to talk about is our out-of-district students. Marlboro has 50 students that were placed out of district. This is 14% of the entire special ed uh, population. And when you compare this to similar districts of our size in New York State, it is within expectations. So we talked about all the things that we do really well. One of the primary purposes is to do a report like this is to get suggestions for improvement. So some of the things that we've gleaned from the report that we've already started working on or will be working on, I'm going to highlight now. In terms of organizational considerations, a key thing we're going to do is develop and implement a comprehensive special education district plan for our district. This will give clear expectations of who we are and what we do for our students. It will include regulations, internal policies and procedures, as well as clear guidelines for our veteran and then also our new teachers coming to the district. It's important for us to continue our annual trainings on these process and procedures. We're going to continue all the professional development efforts that have been given to provide strategies to support all of our students. We want to enhance the working environment, not only with our special ed teachers, but also among our general ed teachers across the district. We're revisiting things like co-teaching. We're looking at our teaching assistants to make sure they have the skills to assist the students. Not only are we looking at academic um, professional development, but we're also looking at those things, uh, those professional development opportunities for mental health and behavioral issues. And then finally, the reorganization of student services to really allow greater administrative capacity and collaboration with the building level staff. It is imperative to be able to plan and support instruction as well as to um, make sure that everyone is aware of all the mandates that we must follow. Really collaborating and working on problem solving to help all of our students. In terms of where we want to grow for continuum of supports, we're going to continue to implement the comprehensive kindergarten through 12th grade response to intervention program. And we're going to continue to review our continuum of special education services. We want to make sure that all of our programs offered kindergarten through 12th grade are, are um, all students are included. When students transition from one grade or school or program, it should be seamless. To do this, we need to make sure that there's consistent and uniform programming that ensures all the needs with students with disabilities are consistently being met until they graduate. We want to plan for all students and keep all of our students in our home district whenever it's possible. So that's our summation of the report. So if you have questions. Uh, I have a question on the RTI. Mm -hmm. There are 10 steps, correct? 10 steps. Like 10. Um, procedures or if they don't get, get to one step, they go to another one. How long does a child stay in RTI? There are three tiers. Mm -hmm. So tier one, all students in a classroom pr are provided with special um, instru you know, instructional strategies. That's tier one. That's in the general ed. If that's not working, then 
there are additional strategies in tier two, and then you can go to tier three. So how long do we keep them there? Do we keep them there a year, two years, three years? They're not progressing. They're not um, going forward. They're kind of like just plateaued. We haven't done anything. They're just, we'll say, borderline failing, um, and yet we keep them in there without uh, sending them to special education to be tested. How long do they stay? Because I have to be honest, from September to Thanksgiving, if you're putting our, our, um, the RTI in place, you should see a little growth. Between that and Christmas, again, you should start seeing growth. Not that we've wasted a whole year and we keep leaving them in RTI, and we've done that. Um, so my question is, how long do we leave them in RTI? Each does child does not pertain to the individual child, depending on how it they're does, progressing. But, but, so uh, right. I, I, yes. I'm just curious how we can put that specifically have, in a box for. Well, because I what happens is if the child that. is not progressing and not getting forward, it's a whole year of education that we left them there and they're not progressing. Why have we not tested them? Why have we not gone forward? How do and we know that we don't? What? How do because we know that I, we don't? I, I've been doing this a long time, and, I, and it's the same kids that are there that are struggling. Why haven't we gone forward? Why have, because we left them in RTI. Some of the parents were actually told that they're not testing them until they go into our RTI. But and I think that, at that point now we're, we're talking about very specific. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really talking about just in general. Okay. We, we, we leave our students in RTI. Is that true in general? We leave our students in RTI without any pro so it all depends on the individual student. When a student is making no progress whatsoever for whatever research-based intervention is put in place, they will be referred. And since I've been here for only a short amount of time, I have received referrals from the RTI committee. So referrals can come in throughout the year. It's not like they wait until June to send the referrals. So since I've been here for this little amount of time, um, we're receiving referrals. I have been invited to some of the meetings and they are data driven and completely looking at where the student was, where they are now, and how are we gonna get them to improve. When they're not improving, then we're having those conversations send the paperwork to us. I, my question would be is how often do we, the kids in that are in RTI, I'm trained from Denver for the RTI program, is, is it done like every eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks? What does our district do for their RTI? Um, their Mr. Brooks, do you mind if I let um, Ms. Kaplan just address that piece um, from the elementary level? Sure. Because it's, it's quite um, involved in detail, but could she can you, just briefly could tell you, just, you. Could you just introduce? Ms. Sure, Kaplan. hi. Okay. <laughs> I'll introduce myself. <laughs> I know everyone. Hi, Dara Kaplan. So I chair RTI at the elementary school. Uh, we do work collaboratively, K-12. All students are in tier one, which is good first teaching. It happens the, in the classroom. From there, some students do receive tier two services, which is academic intervention services. That's every other day, so it's three times six. Mm -hmm. The AAS providers meet with me every A day, so once in a six day cycle. We go child by child and we say, this is working, this isn't working, why isn't this working? And they bring me both reading samples, writing samples, math samples, every once a week. So we go through every single student, decide this was working for four weeks, maybe it's not going to work now, let's try something different. If the child after six to eight weeks is not showing any growth, no matter what we do, um, then we move to an RTI meeting where, when we're going from tier two to tier three at that point. We do invite the parents in, just let the parents know, hey, this is where we are in place and time. This is what's working, this is what's not. We're going to increase the services. And so at that point, we increase the services to six times six. So every single day that try, and we also decrease the amount of students in that group. So maybe they had five students in their, five peers in their, in their group at that point. Now they're going to two or three peers daily. When that happens, then I'm also, when I meet with those teachers, I also now include the general education teacher into that meeting. Um, every D-Day we have data meetings, and at those, that those are by grade level, so at those data meetings, any student that is receiving, receiving tier three services, weekly data is being given to us. After six weeks of that point, if there's still no growth, we then change the program, we then see what's, you know, exactly what's happening with the student, and then we do the referral for special education. Okay. And how long at that point does it take to test that child? From the so time that I send my referral? From, right, because we've already 
put this child in motion, and we'll say it's now. It's no more than. It's now February. It's if uh, at the elementary level, it's no more than 12 weeks if a child's not showing okay. growth. Okay. So that's we, we we do everything by holidays just because that's the way we work. Right, right, right. Right. So from from our point, how long is it? It depends. Sometimes we have a hard time getting the parents to sign the referrals. Right. Um, so it's 60 I'm just school days. On average, does it take four months? No, they have. We have. Sorry. Go ahead. 60 school days. From the time that we receive written consent from the parent, we have 60 school days to evaluate and determine right. eligibility. Right. But do we try to get it done? Sooner than the 60 yes. days because that's three months. There's again, no that's reason for months. us to hold off on it. So, okay. you know, as soon as we get the referral in or, or as soon as we get the consent in to evaluate, it's given to um, the appropriate staff members to conduct those specific evaluations. Once those evaluations are received in our office, we're scheduling that meeting. That's fine. So, Joanne, like right now, we have five students in elementary school that are waiting for testing. Okay. We now increase those students to nine times six. Good. Wow. So, Good. just because we, we know there's we know there's a concern, we don't want to wait for testing. I don't I don't need testing to tell us that, you know, Joey or Tommy need, needs more help. So now we go to nine times six, and the teachers then, and we also pull them for longer times. Um, with those exact students, we have the AAS providers pushing in for 20 minutes at the end of the day, just to make sure that things are wrapping up. Like, do you know what to do tonight? Simple things that you just need a little extra help with. And then once those students go through the process and get the services that, that they need, the AAS providers move on to another group, like another little mini cohort. It's so they Kathleen. help them get their homework together what, and everything else. That's what does nine part. times six mean? Means every day plus three, plus, and then three days a week, twice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they get so services. Nine times in a six-day cycle. Yeah. Nine times in a six-day six cycle. Nine times in a six-day cycle. Just because I, we, we can't wait. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we just want to try other yeah. little pieces. So we, we do a program called Level Literacy Intervention. Mm -hmm. And that's six times, so it's every single day. Yeah. Then for the three additional times, the teachers are pushing in and seeing what's happening in the classroom and how can they support them. If it's as simple as just, you know, reading, reading the, you know, rereading the text to them. Oh. Just something so the child feels successful. Okay, thank you. So... John, did you have the a middle question? School and, um, the middle school and the high school, do they do the same procedure every uh, days with the data and everything and, and get the RTI information? How do you deliver your services now? Because the elementary yeah. is the base and then we go up. Right. And, and, and kids just Ms. Clinton can respond to that, but the intensity is not needed at that level as well, intense. Because we've diagnosed that. Well, because right. if you're in fifth grade and you're going to sixth grade and you're in So their services so follow again, them. Again, that's what I'm trying to yes. ask. Mm -hmm. So again, so yes. in agreement with that, they're, they're now leaving us, so we have anxiety, right? They're going on to middle school. Um, we've created a transition committee between the elementary school and the middle school, and we sit and we talk about, we pull the entire fifth grade team together and the entire sixth grade team together, and we go child, it's laborious, child by child by child. This is where we're ending up. This is what Joey needs. This is what Tommy needs. And then we in the RTI forms that are obviously a legal document, we put return in September for evaluation. So that then they contact us when the child enters sixth grade and said, hey listen, this is where we ended up, this is what has to happen next. So we, we spend, it's a whole day, I mean it's hours and hours and hours Good. going through every single student that we have concerns with, whether it's just, if they just had extra, you know, some students are teacher monitored, which means they haven't yet reached tier two. They just, we just have some concerns. Correct. We go from there all the way Those up to tier that you four. Can kind of like push a little at a time, but there's right. other kids that we need to hold on to and actually help up over that fence to get right. in there. Um, at this point, do we know how many children in our school district are in RIT? Are in RTI. The RTI. So every month the numbers go to Central. Um, there are about 25 students at, on each grade level in Tier 2 and Tier 3, and every, every month we go child by child, go through it, and then we send the numbers to Central. So we can get you that if you want to see it. I don't have it district up. District wide. District wide? District wide, how many students do we have that are we doing support? I don't know. Oh, I secondary. I we'll, we'll get that number. Yeah and get it out to the board. Yeah, and, and John, you have a question? At the high school level, how yeah. do we do this now at the high school, from the middle school to the high school to transition? John also Because the kids just don't get, at again, eighth grade, get to go to high school and say, hey, That's I'm free of services. They still need a support service. So, I, can, um, I can't imagine that our, we're letting our, them RTI go. In high school, huh? Joanne, we have the same type of transition meetings. 
as what was just described in the middle school, we do the same thing going to the high school. A little bit different because the needs are different. Right, and I know we didn't have a reading teacher at one point at the high school. Do we have a reading teacher now at the high school? We, we do have reading services in the high school. It's, it's actually part of a person's day who's a certified reading teacher. In addition to that, we have AIS for English and AIS, AIS for Mathematics, which is the tier two intervention for okay. the students. It's direct service. It's actually designed to prepare students for the Regents exam in English and math. Um, it's a little bit different because by the time students get to high school, they've been through, um, when students are in elementary school, you're really learning all about them and figuring out how they're progressing and moving in different levels. By the time students are at the high school level, they've, we've had, got a body of information that's really helpful in terms of placing students in courses. And um, sometimes the courses themselves vary. You have students that take um, courses where they need a lot of supervision and help all the way up to um, courses that are college level um, for the senior year. So I think there's a lot more disparity in the high school experience um, than it's a different it's a different experience. It's the same model. We meet routinely to talk about students. We meet uh, monthly to discuss students. We discuss students more often um, if necessary. We look at things like attendance. We look at things like um, you know, students failing courses. We have recommendations from teachers. Our transition from the middle school to the high school is a um, series of meetings. The recommendations for AIS services from the middle school to the high school are from the teachers at the middle school, but then our high school folks also look at data points and make evaluations, and we have star assessments along the way in English and math to monitor student progress as they begin at the high school. Uh -huh. And that, just so everyone knows, that is different than a 504. Yes. yes. Right. Yep. So this way everyone knows that that's a whole different ballgame even before you get to a CSE meeting. Um, Thank you. I know that John Cantone has a question. John? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I have a couple of questions and it's probably more of my understanding of some of the things you have up there for uh, both the celebrations and the uh, opportunities. Where if you is? could put back the celebrations. So the first one that there's it's a highlight that's one, only 1% 1 growth in the past five years of special ed. Now, I don't understand how that's a positive thing, or maybe you can explain to me what, how that ties to something we're doing that would maintain that. Because in, in my limited understanding, I would think that's more of a, a function of chance in terms of how many children come into kindergarten that need services or who, who transfer in. But this implies it ties more to something we might be doing in our program. So maybe you can just help me understand why that's a good thing? I just beg these ladies to let me respond to that question because of our experience with RTI across all of those partner districts we've worked with. Um, people often ask us, why are we looking at RTI? We've been brought in to look at special ed, and RTI is clearly a general education initiative. We look at it because here's what happens when my phone rings. It's typically a superintendent who says, my special ed numbers are skyrocketing. We've worked with districts where schools had 30% of their students in special ed. Staggering number. When we go, invariably we find that RTI is not functional in that district. And what happens is you wind up with good people who care about children saying, okay, we've gotta get the struggling students some help. There's no RTI support system. Special ed's the only game in town, guess where they wind up in special education. We've worked with districts with poor RTI systems where fully 30% of the students who were referred to special ed didn't qualify as having a disability. Tremendous wasted motion and resources around that whole process for students who could have had their needs met with an effective RTI system. What you've just heard described here in your district while admittedly still a work in progress, which they always are, is far and away putting you above, I would say, 85% of the districts we've worked with in terms of your RTI processes and delivery mechanism. That effective intervention, short of special ed, is what helps keep that number intact, okay? So by identifying children at risk and putting them in the RTI program, you actually can prevent them having to go as far as needing services because the intervention process and, and everything as part of that There's can a, keep them back, get them back on track. So in, 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 just to put it bluntly, 
there are many, many kids who struggle at various points in their educational career who do not have an educational disability, okay. and with effective interventions, we can meet their needs okay. and, as you say, get them back on track. So it, then the answer to my the quick answer to the question is it directly ties to our effectiveness in RTI as a program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Because I, I just yeah. didn't know. I don't have enough experience there. If you could turn it to the next slide, the opportunity. So I have a general question here. So when you look at some of these develop and implement a comprehensive plan and uh, annual training, that implies we're not doing that today. Is that what that means, or are you really saying something to the effect of improving? No, our reason? annual trainings is to continue those annual trainings. So we find that in a lot of districts, if you just train once, and then you expect people to stay at that level of understanding. But if we do annual trainings, we're catching um, anybody that has questions or if there's any changes in mandates or regulations or strategies, so the annual. We are always reviewing our process and our plan, and you just heard them talking about you know, RTI. Groups of children change, um, the needs change. We now have tiered, differentiated materials for all of our groups. So that's a change, so that's more training. So it's ongoing. Um, a heavy focus on behavioral interventions, classroom management interventions, but things change with the students and with the needs. You might want to speak to yeah, that. I, okay, I got, I got one more. Um, so on the positive side, we had a good ratio of, I think you said teachers and teachers' aides, et cetera, to the, to the number of children in need. But then there was also on page 12 a whole section of that, our, from our director perspective, we were very lean. Mm -hmm. And you even uh, proposed a couple of coordinators at the school level. Now, at the same time, we're talk, we were in the process of doing a reorganization. So, uh, but I didn't see you specifically say that as a, well, unless maybe that's what that means. I'm, what my simple question is, are we saying that the work we are about to do or in the process of doing to reorganize will address this as you laid it out as a potential opportunity or is there more we might need to look at? Maybe you can speak to what you put in the program, right. and, and I can speak to, or Robin can speak to our organizational structure because it's, it's, com it's connected. So what, yeah, we, what we found in doing our staffing comparison was that you fell within expected ratios in most of the positions, but in terms of your organizational structure for administration of the program, you were very lean. The concern around that, you know, some people might look at that and say, great, we're being so efficient. No, it's a false false image. What is happening in districts where they're very lean or stretched administratively is special ed is the most highly prescribed and regulated area within public education in New York State. There are things that are not discretionary that must by law and regulation be accomplished. When you're understaffed administratively, what we find is that all of the administrative time is directed to meeting the mandates. The CSE and CPSE can be all consuming in and of themselves. What that costs that's hidden is it costs the leadership activities that those administrative people want to do and that the district wants and needs them to do. So visioning, program development and implementation, quality assurance, support, professional development of staff, supervision, those are the things that go begging while short-staffed administrative time goes into meeting the mandates of those timelines you just heard about around CSE referrals, for example. So that was our concern. The quality, and we don't do personnel evaluation, but throughout our interviews, the people in those roles, the, the, the director position, particularly very well regarded, doing excellent work, within a very stretched capacity. We look typically for a ratio of one administrator in special ed for every 150 to 250 students. You were well above that, almost double the lower end of the range at 350 or so. Um, that, that's too lean to do the quality work that this district aspires to, in our opinion. One of the things that we strategize when we have the opportunity to look at our organizational structure was this was one of the opportunities, knowing that this was in the report. John and I had some 
some real conversations about this early on, that um, it was an opportunity. So we peeled a number of responsibilities from the director of pupil services or student services office that uh, were not directly related to special education away from that office, retitled it to director of special education and distributed those non-special education specific responsibilities um, thank you to Robin, Rose as the assistant superintendent also, and also Mike. So those, those responsibilities then, I guess, so to speak, lighten the load from those areas and allows uh, Megan now as our director of special education for, I think you're coming up on uh, a little while now, um, to focus purely on that piece. Does that meet the letter of what John's recommendation is? No, it does not. The, rec the ratio is still the ratio. It just does help as far as um, uh, some of those ancillary responsibilities and the focus. Um, it's certainly something that we have to watch very carefully. Just to give you perspective too, the reason, uh, actually the, the, one of the entry points that I asked John when he and I met privately on, on putting this uh, project together was, understand John that we, this was the conversation, we expect that our programs and our people will help our children progress towards, and you've heard this before, the highest possible diploma that they can attain with the richest set of courses on their transcript with the highest GPA. My simple question to John was, please look at our special education program and is that program partnering in that same process for the children on the special ed education side of our ledger? That's all I want. Now obviously the details go very deep under that, but that was really the entry point for John as he started to look at our programming. Are our special education children getting what they should to progress to that potential? And that's really the, the main focus. So after we had question for all of our work, basically, this was a district that wants to make students to succeed. Everything that we <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I interpret it. I read the report, and there's a lot. I mean, I'm, this is not my area of expertise by any means, but it seemed overall, as you just summed up, very positive. We're in a good place. This one kind of lit up for me because we've had numerous conversations about going to where we're going anyway, and then these elementary and secondary coordinator positions. I, I take it that's work to be discussed and things to look at late down. Listen, on. all this, th this next layer, this was an easy way that we could tackle a couple of things. The reorganization, actually John and I just said it probably an hour ago together upstairs, and, and I think I've said it to this group privately and publicly. Anytime there's a, an opportunity to look at a position because a staff member moves on, whether they retire, whether they go to another district or whatever, it's an opportunity to look at how our system can grow into even grander ways. Mm -hmm. So if we don't approach the hiring process that way, something's wrong with us. So it's easier to do that when it's an administrative role because there's a lot of flexibility in what we assign to an administrator. If you're going to teach third grade, you're going to teach third grade. So right. that, that doesn't mean that we don't look for the best third grade teacher, but their scope of what they're responsible for is the teaching third grade. Um, does that mean that we should immediately start talking about, listen, we need a, an assistant director for elementary assistant, no, no. Should it be part of the grander scheme of dialogue when we look at where we want that program to be? Yeah, we probably should. So if there's next step dialogue that we wanna talk about, if there are things that we are not doing, quite honestly, one of the things I asked Megan to do as she's now flying and assessing is assess our program from her perspective. Spend some real time really digging in, looking at, and getting from her background um, experiences, what does she think are some areas that we want to work in? Uh, it's not something that we can ever just stay stagnant on. And it's not just words, folks. This is real work. So, um, so 
That's, I, yeah. that's I just picked that one so out because when so reading it, the, the recommendation didn't necessarily say hire people. It even specifically said it doesn't have to be an administrative position. You can tie that to existing yeah. staff or whatever. Right. But it sounds right. like work to be done. Basically. Right. It means saying. there's work that has to be done and restructure could be done too, um, which I've been saying. So my question would be, Megan, would you be going into a lot of the special ed classrooms now just to see how they're being done, to see how behaviors are being done? If the school psychologists have come up with behavior plans, have they put them in place? Are they being followed? Um, because those so are, the answer you know, to the overall question is yes, I'm in as classrooms as much as possible. I'm in the elementary school almost every day. Um, today I was in the middle school, I go to the high school, so I'm trying to get into every classroom. I'm also looking at the needs of our students that are placed outside of the district. So I'm really doing a variety of work right now, and it's kind of those cases and situations as they're coming up right now. It is mid-year, so it's, it's a little challenging being January, sure. and annual review season's right around the corner. Uh, we are prepared for that, so um, absolutely. I'm spending as much so, time as possible to build relationships with our staff, to learn our students' names, to see what their needs are, so that when I meet their parents, I can tell them the good things their children are doing, not always just the negative, and really working with our staff on how we can do better for our students. That, that parents would love to hear that, and that's a positive <laughs> effect. Um, my other question is, especially because of the um, behaviors in place, are the school psychologists going into the classroom, observing our students, becoming up with a behavior plan? Because one of the things we do have um, staff development. What I would like to see is more teachers trained in the behaviors, how to deal with the behaviors, this way they don't have to bother the principals and have the principals, because especially in our um, discovery classes and stuff, there are a little bit more challenger be behaviors in those classrooms. How do the teachers deal with them? What do they do? How do they deal with them? Um, if a teacher should be trained in that and how to deal with it like they do out in BOCES. So Not that they have to call the principal and say, oh, this child's screaming or this child got up and walked out of the room. Our teachers, when they take those classes, should know all these and so autism. Absolutely. So, you know, no, no two children are the same. No two classes right. are the same. So um, with Ms. Heck's help, um, professional development has been provided for specific teachers when we see that there's a need in their classroom. So if there's a behavioral issue, if there's a social emotional issue, there will be opportunities identified. Our staff are going to BOCES, to other workshops to gain those skills so they can come back. Um, our clinical team is also there to support. Um, I just read a, an FBA that was done this week, or actually was submitted this week. It was done before break. Um, so those are being conducted as well. So we are addressing the, the changing needs of our students, and it may be one teacher at a time based on need, but we're definitely taking a look at that. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there's a tremendous amount of work that's going into this right now, and I think as a board, we very much appreciate this presentation and Thank the detail you. that you've given us, and um, I think really we can I, can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to congratulate not only for the presentation, but this was really very nice, and what you have accomplished is, is really great. And it's not just the administrative team, it's the efforts and the talent of our teachers that need to really be applauded as well, because the students and the report would not be um, this well, and it's not just special ed, it's general ed, it's the um, service providers, it's everybody as a team. So I just wanna applaud you all for such a wonderful job and such a wonderful report coming back. And it, it was, it's Great. nice to hear that we're yes. going forward with a lot of positive things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to public comment on agenda items. Is there any public comment on reason? The Have meeting's agenda meeting items. Still. Okay. Well, Larry's not supposed to be turning up. Moving on to the consent agenda. Resolve that the Board of Education, upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, approves the contracts, agreements, and reports as presented. Personnel actions and donations. Can I get a motion to approve <coughs> personnel actions and donations? Joanne, Karen. Any discussion? I, I do have a question. 
um, with all the substitute teachers that we're hiring, there's only one social studies teacher? Correct. Okay. The other ones are just regular, they can sub anywhere. Um, I, don't, I don't know what their certifications are, but oh, $80 a day, they're not certified. Uh huh. Yep. I'm just kind of curious because you just have one that says social studies. I'm like, but that's what that's what the person's certification uh -huh. is. But he could, be, or he or she or whoever, can come in and teach any other class if we needed them. Correct. Correct. But what oh. that does is it indicates on the schedule there their rate of pay. So if correct. they're not certified, it's $80 a day. Right. If they're certified, it's $100 a day, and that's just Tells the point the of information of what their certification so, is. They can su they can substitute in anything. So my other question is, are, can the paraprofessionals substitute as teachers too? Can paraprofessionals, can they substitute as teachers too? Yes, if, if we have no one else to fill a slot, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? No. John Marrow? Yes. John Cantone? Yes. Karen? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Myself, yes. Moving on to old business, other items. Is there any old business? Just a quick question. I've been asked a few times, the cell phone tower, where are we at in that? We haven't talked about that in a long time. <laughs> Keeps coming up. Could not have planned that better, John. Oh, good. <laughs> we actually today got commitment from Verizon to meet with us again on Monday to do a planning meeting. The last meeting um, that we had, I want to say it was in November, um, there was a little miscommunication that had happened in the past, so we had to clarify some things, and um, Verizon and their group has gotten back to us today and they are ready to come back to the table and, and discuss it. So hopefully Monday we'll have a very productive meeting and move on from there. It's good timing. Just curious, I keep getting that question everywhere I go. Hmm. Good question. Any other old business before the board? Any new business? Uh, just as an announcement, I chose not to put it in my report and let the board know that I would like to plant a seed tonight that the board certainly can act on it tonight if they wish. However, the seed plant is really for the next meeting. So I would put on the agenda if the board is okay with it. Um, as part of our reorganization in the business office, uh, we need to, uh, we would like to move on to the next phase. We've got several services that right now are being uh, uh, conducted by the central business office service in Sullivan Boses. Two specific services that are being provided out there are payroll services and also accounts payable services. Part of the restructuring plan in the next phase is to bring those two services back into district and eliminate the service at the CBO level um, almost in its entirety. There are some pieces that we'll keep out at the CBO, but we would like to bring the preponderance of the service for payroll almost all of it, except for the accounting side of the Affordable Care Act and um, uh, the Affordable Care Act, which is voluminous in nature. So that piece we want to keep out at the CBO, but bring back the actual accounting piece of, um, of calculating and processing our payroll and producing our payroll in-house. So in order to do the payroll side of things, we would need to create an in-district part-time clerical position of 5.5 hours minimally in order to conduct that service in-district. It's part of the written plan that you folks have seen. Ideally, it would be a full-time position. The full-time position does bring with it benefits. So there's a cost element there. The second piece to that is accounts payable. So right now when we have our um, purchase orders and billing that we have to pay, all that information goes out to the central business office. Central business office processes all that paperwork and actually prints the check and mails it out to the vendor that we have to, we have an ob obligation to. 
We believe we can do that service in-house. We had done it. The person that had done accounts payable still works for us, is doing something different right now. And um, we would like to move on to bring that piece back to district also. That would require a second clerical position, which is a full-time 12-month clerical position. So, so what I just, let me finish. What I just described to you from soup to nuts, beginning with our reorganization at the beginning of this school year when Pat Witherow left us, ending with payroll and accounts receivable and payable, moved back in district. That is a budget neutral shift in our responsibilities. There is a slight savings. You all have the detail of the economics of it. It's about $9,000 in savings in a grand approach to budgeting that $9,000 is negligible, so I look at it as budget neutral. But we'll, you know one of my driving forces here. I'm concerned that our clerical level staff is too thin at district office. Yeah. So by bringing more people into the district in a budget neutral way, we put more people in that office doing the same work it's just not in Sullivan Boses, it's here. We then start to build the capacity for more people in that office so then there's succession planning that can take place when people do move on. They retire, they go elsewhere, things like that. So it's a long-term strategy piece that I'm asking the board um, to now create these two positions. Again, in order to stay budget neutral, it can only be a part-time, five and a half hour a day position. One of them is a part-time, five and a half hour a day, and the other one can be full-time. So, yeah. If we go to both of them being full-time, which is the more ideal way from an organizational structure, we are no longer budget neutral. That would result in about a, what did we, was it $13,000? It would be about $13,000 above the nine, so almost right. $20,000 so, right. more so, than... So like, we would go from budget neutral or $9,000 to the positive to costing us an additional $13,000 annualized. So I just want to give you the full playing field because the part-time position does present some challenges because it's not a stable position in the long run. That particular position would actually be located at the high school because we've transferred someone from the high school full-time to take care of payroll operations. So the ideal would be to replace that at the high school with a full-time clerical. However, the commitment I made to this group is a budget-neutral approach. It is certainly the board's discretion to say, nope, we want two full times, you want budget neutral, it, that's the board's decision. So the, 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 the piece that is presented to you is, um, is just that. So in so order for us to move forward on the next phase, those two positions would need to be created, and I'm asking as soon as possible. I am 100% fine with it being next meeting if the board's comfortable with that. Certainly if it's tonight, that'd be even better, but that is fully up to the board's discretion. And if the board chooses to go to the next level of two full times, that's something we can discuss pluses and minuses of too. So I, I have questions, because now you're talking three people to be hired. No. Uh, payroll? No. Accounts payable? No. Two. Two people to two position, Two positions, two people. You're talking about accounts payable? So yeah, I was going to ask that. So Mike. that's so, that's a fifty thousand dollar position. Hold on, hold Your on. Your payroll is a fifty thousand dollar position. That's a hundred thousand dollars. Hold on, you have the accounting. I gave it to you. Those numbers are wrong. So I want to make sure we're clear. Don't conflate roles and responsibilities and positions. There are two positions we need from the secretarial unit in order to do this phase. The title and civil service is typist or account clerk. We would probably go with account clerk because we want money mm -hmm. sense, we want number sense. It's the same pay rate in our contract. Those two positions, account clerk, part-time account clerk and a full-time account clerk, 
would finish our ability to then assign responsibilities to those people in our current office to take care of accounts payable and payroll. So what they're assigned and what their position is are two different things. We're talking about the position. Oh, so it's two uh, positions, Joanne. There's only two new and, positions. Okay. No, actually, you're, you're talking almost three positions because, again, who's going to do the accounts payable? Joanne, there's two positions. Hold on. Let's, again, I, I think I can help this, Mike. I think I can help you this, You just Mike. said you, were, you wanted to bring back accounts payable. Yes. And not, not only that, so who is doing that? So, Mike, so we're not going to talk about payable. the who because that's an executive okay. discussion. So, Wait, Joanne, let me... Okay. Let me say the answer, please. Two positions. We're bringing, if you think about it just mathematically, we're bringing back two services. I need two people to do those two services. One for payroll, one for accounts payable. And but one please don't payable. connect the service, I'm sorry, the position and the assignment. Because when you hire someone, if we do this, and it's Derek Kaplan. <laughs> Derek Kaplan is not going to be hired as the payroll clerk. She's not going to be hired as the accounts payable. She's going to be hired as the uh, account clerk. And then internally, we will assign Dara responsibilities that will be beyond that. So, uh, so and that's what you're, you're, you're again, uh, I these think two it, positions, which payroll you did say was about a $50,000 position with benefits. Here's what I think, here's what I think this Correct? is. Mike, Mike, didn't the person that left and vacated the high school position take some responsibilities in those roles you're talking about now, whether it be payroll? Sure. Sure. So that's where, I just, that's where the confusion is. There's, there is three positions, but you moved one, right. so you're only adding two people. Or right, by moving her from the high school to the central office, we've created a, a vacancy. A vacancy, and, and, sh and this person is doing one or two she, of the, the payroll. payroll or Primarily she's doing the payroll. payroll. Right. So Primarily. what you're suggesting is we bring in, it, it's really two positions, but one is to backfill correct. the high the school, one, the, which used to be full-time. Correct. And now you want to, you're talking about bringing five, in. Five, so five, what does, 5.5 hours. On, hold on. Can, I, can I just ask yeah, a question? Yeah, when I finish. The, the, and, um, then, and then the accounts payable, if it was a one for one, that would be the second hiring, if you correct. will. Correct. Okay, which uh, yeah. ultimately there's three positions, but you only added two. Correct. Well, one and a half. Correct. Right. Okay. That's so the, the five. Three people. Three two bodies. positions. Three bodies, two how new positions. People, Correct. How could you have three people and only two positions? Well, let's look at how this You have be. to have somebody at the high school part-time. That's right, right. As the One. There's right? The, uh, Accounts payable. Okay. That's two. New. And a payroll clerk. Came okay. over. Three. Was moved from the high school. Joanne. That's the third one. Again, yeah. but the, Joanne, listen. Listen, school, listen uh, to what's yeah. being said. I mean, are you hearing what's being said? I'm hearing it. Okay, so. I'm hearing it, and I'm looking at numbers here that... Uh, the clerk, uh, payroll clerk, gets fifty-two thousand dollars. So I think the what we're saying, I think what we're originally saying here, if if I can, if I, what we're originally saying is, this is Mike's proposal. He has two proposals before the board. He wants us to either one, think about it, or two, act upon it. If there's very specific questions about that, but I think. He's doing a really good job explaining what's needed. And he also gave us a lot of instruction about the proposals. So and I'm, looking at I'm confused tax. about. Let me tell you where the numbers well, came from. Number Joanne. one is payroll Joanne, being still, you, be, still being done me, up at uh, BOCES. Let me tell you where the numbers came from. So the two new positions that you see on your proposal in front of you, Correct. the full-time clerical at 52,518, mm -hmm. that is the all-in number. So that's salary and benefits, step one. Right. So that would be for a new hire. Yeah. But when you were at the high, when the, the high school the part -time, at full-time was not me, getting the, that money. But, that was there. but that's shifted. That yeah. Was there. So think about it this way. Uh, let me, let me, that, this might help. If we were to purely create two positions, nobody transferred, nobody moved anywhere. We create two positions by contract we are required to post those positions Correct. so that if there's internal people, they can apply for that. Correct. So think that we did that, essentially. Because we internally transferred someone from the high school and brought them to the central office. You all know the reason why. We can't stop doing payroll because Pat left. 
So who was doing so payroll before? Who, it was Sue Smith, who is now our school business manager. So can I just ask? And remember, you can't, you so, can't, can, can, I'm sorry, Karen, one more second. Okay. You can't keep on mixing positions and responsibilities because the board does not appoint people to a responsibility. Right. The board appoints people not to a position. So I don't want anybody to get comfortable that I only do payroll. There's going to be a laundry list of stuff that they do underneath that too. It's just that's the biggest responsibility. So I'm sorry, Karen. <laughs> the 5.5, that's the position that's in the high school? And is that like in the guidance office? Or I don't remember where that was when, at. When it was in the high school, it was full time. And, and it was in the guidance? And the person that we took from the high school and is now doing payrolls full time. Because we so might want to stay budget neutral, I would need to refill that, which I know Mr. Lawler would prefer full time, yeah. with full time. But again, the we commitment need, was budget neutral. So in order to stay budget neutral, which is what I'm presenting to you, it has to be part-time. I'm board thinking. can choose differently. But I'm, I'm thinking that we might want to consider full-time. The reason is, option, and, right. and consider it as a board, because of the fact that you're going to get a lot more job applicants that are going to look for a full-time job than a part-time job with no benefits. You're, it might increase your applicant pool on the quality of the worker. I, so I spoke with the uh, union head from, the, um, from this particular unit this morning for quite some time, just to make sure she had an understanding of where my proposal was. And uh, while she's a wonderfully supportive, terrific staff member, she raised the same point. But again, my commitment was budget neutral. So, so that's this the won't be point. saving us money. This will be costing them money. The okay. So money. again, there are two options on the table, and one of them is sure. one of them is budget neutral, and the other one is approximately thirteen thousand dollars above what we are currently at. Because with the change in BOCES, we went to, I believe. Uh, minus $33,000 and then there ended up to be like a $4,000 uh, or $4,000 or $14,000 difference, right. something but like that. There's no savings here. So if we left it at BOCES, there is really savings. There is savings. There is not there's for hiring two full time people with benefits. We're talking about over $100,000. Okay. Joanne, Joanne, with the changes, the chart I sent today with the changes, the savings is $9,000. So right. you can't say it's not saving. If you're hiring two full-time people, it's not. That's with hiring them, Joanne. No, it's hiring a part-time and a full-time. Correct. See, that's where we're getting confused in Correct. the conversation. What I'm trying to explain is right now we're in new business. Mike brought up the idea of having a proposal. One is the proposal that is budget neutral. Two is the proposal that is not budget neutral, approximately $13,000 in difference. That's it, that's all, that's all that's happening right now. We're either going to say, we're gonna vote on this for him to move forward, we're gonna decide as a board, we're gonna go budget neutral, or we're going to decide to hire the, to yeah, yeah. allow him to hire the full-time staff. So it's up to the board at this point what are we going to do? You know, I just, how just throw money. my point out there. You guys will all have your votes tonight. I would be prepared tonight to vote for the two full time or wait till next week. I would vote against the full time and part time, just so you guys know where I'm at. I'm in the same boat with you. I would vote for two part time tonight. I mean, two full time tonight. I'm worried about a part time person, especially if they're going to be dealing with the students. I'd rather have the higher caliber person. I thought they were in guidance. No, they're going to be in the. Uh, Accounts payable. No. Because now I'm confused again. So we pulled somebody out of guidance. So that, that was full time. Can, correct. And we've hired a substitute full time. That's costing us money. Correct. So again, there is no savings here. We're going to stop the substitute as soon as we hire the person. I can't right. not. But have there is. A, but you keep saying there's savings here. There is no savings here there's for our taxpayers. We've got to right. think about this there, in the long term. Right now, so do we, you, we're, the spending longer we, we're spending money. Joanne, the longer we delay in making this decision, we spend the longer money we're every day. The money with the subs. So yes. So do you need someone to make a motion to? Uh, before uh, well, I have a question, I have, I have another question. Yeah. Mike, I, now I'm looking at the sheet, which I was looking at before. But one thing that I'm, I need some clarification on. So when we're looking at 
the comparison of reducing costs from BOCES by moving accounts payable and um, payroll services in-house. Yes. Take away the fact that a substitute doing it now doesn't matter. And then bring in a accounts payable person, a person, right, into the central office to do that work that were taken from BOCES and then backfill the part-time in high school. You're talking about the 9,000 savings, but this, the aid, reduction in aid, how does that fit into that? I, it looks like right. it, it, so in the big picture it question. remains neutral, but if you were to put a yeah. box around just those savings, that yeah. aid would take us to a negative, the, right? No, we no the aid the is aid. factored in, sorry. Okay, but okay go ahead, that's what aid. I want to hear, because right. I misunderstood. So the that. way that we calculated here so that we could do apples to apples comparison, did you want to speak to it, Rose, or um, when you have a BOCI service, many of them are, have aid associated with them. So what the negative on the top chart and the negative on the bottom so chart shows that. is the accounting for the aid that you would receive. It's actually shown as a revenue. I know an accountant would, this is my chart by the way, would flip it the other way. There the salaries were a negative and that would have been a positive. So when we're buying $141,000 worth of services for this particular CBO service, the top chart, we get $101,000 worth of aid. Okay, so that's where When the we change it to just the BOCES fee, the Affordable Care Act work and WinCap, which is the software that we use for personnel management and payroll management, business management, the cost of the COSER is 44,000, the aid is 32,000. So we get 32 of the 44 back. Okay, so I see that now. Okay. Okay, so matter? yes, so the net of so reduction- you get less aid because so you're spending less. Wait, okay, so what you just basically said is that reduction in aid baked into the calculation still results in the numbers you were stating, the minus Correct. nine or the plus 13, depending on full time. Correct. Card. We're getting a lot less aid, but we're spending a lot less because yes. you can only yes. get the aid if you spend it. Right, right, right. So is, it, is it fair assessment, the way, I'm, the way I'm saying this, Pat moved on to another district and we were able to get somebody, a director of special education, and three full-time people put a lot more work into our office for a cost of 13000 That's the way I'm looking at yeah. it. That's why I'm saying I would vote for it. Because that seems like a, a good assessment and a good addition to our... That's essentially what it is. Okay, yeah. I'm in the same spot. So do you need a motion? Is that what we're looking at right now? How's everyone so feeling about I, it? I, I, I'm just... So now the budget will hold this, correct? What was that? So, but yet when I asked for aides to be put in a kindergarten class, I was told there was no money in the budget. But we always seem to find money in the budget when there's things that you want for the business office. I'll say um, it again, so. because, and this is a very respectful statement, Joanne, I would love to put the aides in there tomorrow, to put an aide in every kindergarten class, that's six aides. The aides are gonna cost us somewhere in the neighborhood, anywhere ranging from, say, $25,000 to $50,000, whether they're full-time or part-time, six I'm times that number, we're over $100,000, $150,000 of expenditures. That's very different than what I'm it, proposing it, it as It just amazes me that we're, because the aides will help our students get over and help the teachers because having 25 kindergarten Agreed. children in a classroom. Agreed. Again, so that's where we should be looking. I'm sorry, but this, this service, is this is you know, we're 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 I not talking about the same thing. Money. We're not talking about the same thing. Right now, We're what not. we have done is we had a reorganization at the central office. That is very specifically what we are talking about here. And we have to stay on topic because I'm sure many of us could, if it were our jobs, we could do this all night long. Well, I, but I, the I, fact I, of the matter is this is what, I don't know, a month or so ago, we instructed the superintendent by vote, we said, okay, this is where we are gonna go. And so well, this is where we are going. It has to be dealt with and we cannot we allow were, ourselves to go backwards when we've already voted for something. Now we have to put the details in place. And this is what he's proposing we do. Either we do it budget neutral or we do it with this well, proposal that he is, that's now on the table. Can I help, can I help I out with this, I was Joanne? part of the, the thing part of this when we had to let everybody go because Joanne, can we didn't I help have out a little money. bit? And again, these all become co uh, Joanne, um, contracts. can I help out a little bit? Yeah. We're about to enter into budget discussions as a board. By the time we get ourselves into the latter part of February and certainly all through March, we're gonna be in here discussing budget the whole time. Can I present the Board of Education and I'll put an item on the 
deliberations for us to consider the aids for kindergarten. So then it can be a debated, dialogued topic and honors your request that we can at least discuss it. I mean, I think that that is, uh, it's not that I'm against it. <laughs> I'm looking at the budget piece, so let's talk about it in budget. So it is, it's, except yes on that, that we'll bring it to budget and discuss it in budget. And again, to me, this is going to cost us more money. Because again, I was part of, unfortunately, letting people go out of that business office. And for us to do this and bring everybody back, it, can, it comes back with a contractual obligation oh, uh, but to the taxpayers of this community where we are not making that much money. People are still losing their homes. And yet, oh, let's you know, put another $100,000 into the budget and, and stop this program and bring it back. Hold on, we hold on. If I, can, if I can be a part of this discussion too, listen, there, I don't believe that anybody sitting up here anybody wants to add any more burden on any taxpayer in this town, period. I think what we are doing, and I think that if you would think about it for a minute, I believe you would agree. We are in a position where we have a superintendent that is looking at every component of the district as soon as he gets opportunity. And when he finds that opportunity, he's bringing it to the board to fine tune it. And we have, every one of us have been in that position to hear him. We've been able to debate it. And I think the debate is very healthy. But when we get to a point where we've all made a decision or the majority has made a decision, we have to move on. And we have to make or allow him to make the next step. So that's where we are. What is the next step? There is no one, and, and quite honestly, it upsets me that you're gonna say that in public, in a public forum that implies the rest of us don't care about the taxpayers. Because Joanne, you know everyone's heart here. I mean, we're not getting paid a salary to be here. Right. There is no incentive to be here except to serve this community and to serve yeah. it well. And I believe that you do that and I think everyone else here does that. But yeah. it's very upsetting to hear that you're acting like you're the only one that cares and all we want to do is spend money. Well, I, well I'm looking at it, Sue. I'm what? looking at this. And again, it's now, budget and neutral. We another, and we have it's budget neutral or well, $13,000 above like to know what currently... We're paying for a sub that we pulled out. Yeah, uh, gonna... And how much have we paid that sub to be there? Right now? As a board, we, it's we... sunk money. We can't converse, talk about the past. We did this as a transition. You have to look at things in isolation. You have a outsourced service to BOCES. We're paying 144000 whatever it is, total. But we get eight. Uh, we, yes, we, we do. The numbers that. match. What, what Mike is suggesting, you got to look at that in isolation. Down. You have to look at that in isolation because now we're down to the question after all the reorgs that we said yes to and that are in place, does it make sense that, to bring the BOCES work in-house versus keep it where it is in an outsourced environment? I'm going to use that word because I know that very well. And does it make sense to us to do it first from a budget neutral perspective? perspective, number one, and if the answer is yes to that, it gives us other advantages of, of expanding their work, of bringing that work in-house, of, of spreading the work around, of creating succession plans and backup plans, which is where I was the most concerned when we had the vote in the whole thing, the whole reorg in the first place, is how do you get the backups? How do you take away the dependency on one or two heroes that are in that business office and, uh, when they decide to retire or decide to move on? So th think of it in isolation, it's a box. It's how much money we're spending now for a service, which is a combination of outsourced service and in-house, and move it back in. And when the, when the equation is equal, the only question I, I, I think that you had that might have some relevance that I want to ask is, you, if you're implying that if you bring that in-house and it's a contracted service, that it's going to cost more over time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think, I'm going to ask Mike, what your experience is on this, but I'm going to think that that's not true because BOCES isn't going to go down over time. They're going to go up because there's physical people over there mm -hmm. getting paid contracted services Correct. over there, so yeah. their costs are going to go up just like ours would go up. So now, right is that now, right? Like the, yeah, so, every, uh, so right every, now, John, every, let, it, let him answer with first. Bo, with BOCES, okay, right now with our thing is $100,000, correct? No. We're paying uh, uh, BOCES 100000 
What chart are you reading from? The one I just gave you? BOCES 8 with, with 8, okay. No, BOCES Current Central Business Service, 141,451. Okay, and that's without the 8? That's with the- The 8 is two lines down from that. Okay, so we're getting, so technically- The math we're is done getting, for if you. We're, if we're Joanne, the math the is eight. done for you. Yeah, of course. $266,197 is what our pre-reorg costs were for PAT, CBO, that part-time unfilled position, and the aid net. It was $266,000. Post-reorg, it's $257,061 for a savings of $9,136. And that includes bringing two new positions. Two full-time positions. <laughs> no, the chart you have in front of you is Number part one, position. a part-time, I'm sorry, number right. one, a full-time, number two, a part-time. That's a net savings of $9,136,000. If the board chooses to go to two full-times, it actually turns into a net cost, cost of, of $13,000. Which is a bargain. Well, I'm just trying to level the playing field. So okay. the answer to John's question, if you actually could refresh my memory. The question was, <laughs> In your experience, do you see the contracted services going up equal go up to year. or more than oh. if you had them in-house? The BOCES costs, that we get a, a cost structure every year. Uh, the BOCES boards actually set those costs. They go up pretty close to what a contractual response. I mean, those costs go up because the costs associated with BOCES goes up. Right. So supplies, materials, contracts, et cetera. So that just gets reflected in this right. service. So well, it I doesn't mean, stay flat at 141. Right. And that's it. That's what it I was. It goes up by a contracted amount with BOCES. That's why I brought we, it up because it sounded like that was something in what Joanne was saying that would be something to ask. Yeah. It could, if that stayed stable and our contracted services go up naturally over time, Ours would get more expensive, but but it's not. Correct. There's real bodies in those services. I mean, I, I, that's what I do for a living. And, and, and there's people as, in there. John, and as far as like correct. people retiring with the uh, services through BOCES, they're constantly being trained. Here, if somebody return, if somebody retires again, we have to rehire somebody, retrain them, and um, not everybody knows because we've been through this before. When somebody has left. Um, or somebody has a day off, nobody can do anybody else's work, or they go on vacation well, for a week. Well, I think that's what, it, it's rather, that's to um, Mike's point. Well, we're, we're, we're in more of a situation of that now, because there's one accounts payable person which was taken and moved from the high school. If that person calls in sick, you're calling in a sub. But if Mike, if Mike is trying to build a team so there's cross-training, there's cross-responsibilities, and there's, there's, a, there's a backup plan, there isn't a single person uh, point of failure. That's what he's trying to get to in a small office in his, you know, as part of the bigger restructure. We need to That's look why at you this. have to look at it in isolation, talking about other budgeting factors. or, And you can't keep referring to the third position as a full-time. That was already there. It, that cost didn't go up. It's the same cost. Moved Actually, from it here did to go here. up because... That person wasn't making the same amount of money at the high school. Yes, they were. They are. Yeah, exactly. there was no raise there. There's no raise when you come to central okay. office. Same right, money. We're, we're, at the, we're at the we're at the point where we the just have to decide: change. are we going to do the reorg just right, or think. we voted to do it, and we are we going to do it right? And I really feel you do it right. And if you're going to do this, and you're going to do the two, I think we should just vote for the two jobs, open it, and let you start hiring and do what you want to do with your reorg. Yeah. Okay, there's a. Are you, is that a motion? I'm, I'm making a motion to hire two full-time positions uh, at a, at, um, with an additional 13000 a payroll clerk and a, what, what's the position in guidance? Um, we actually it would, uh, I, I, I would like you to create, the motion would be to create, if it's the full-time piece, the motion would be to create two full-time account clerks. I'd like to make a motion to create two full-time account clerks. I second it. 12 month, I'm sorry, add that please. 12 month. 12 month. Mike. Yes. I don't know if we should be that specific as far as account clerk, because I think That's we should look at service roles. service piece, so we Correct. want to do it as secretarial or clerical? Clerical. Clerical? clerical? Two full-time clerical why positions. Why would, we, why would we need 12 months? They work in the summer. Because guidance, they work, guidance well, works if you're working in the guidance, they, there's guidance a lot works that happens summer. in the guidance in the summer. They already have a full-time Guidance works all summer. Minus vacation. Guidance office is open all yeah. summer long. 
There's parents and students in and out of that office all summer long. And there's a lot so of as a reporting right now up, comes out of the high school that, that you need those staff members. No, we can so do it right these now. positions so are, the, are so all the, 12 months with the So 13, the motion 000. would be clarified here as to create two full-time clerical positions. Two full-time 12-month clerical positions. Can I get a motion to create two full-time 12-month clerical positions? I motion. Second. Yes. John. I, I just have one question. <laughs> one more point of discussion. You have to ask that. What is the risk if we, we didn't go full time with the high school guidance uh, admin and or clerical and stayed part time? What's the risk? Like, what are we losing? What are we missing? I, uh, about two to three hours a day worth of work. I mean, that's. I know, but is I, also, that, I also feel quality of candidate that would apply. That's, okay. that's my, that's my biggest thing is the quality of candidate that would apply for a full time with benefits as opposed to a part time. I feel the quality of candidate would be so much better. You're more apt to hire, you're more apt to find a career person with a full time position. It's a transient position when they're part time. So, so, the I guess what I was getting at is there today work not getting done as a result of Right well, now, you right now you get nobody. If you're literally talking about Thursday, yeah, yeah. the high school guidance office is scrambling with transiency because of substitutes. Well, so we really right need to move on here. So. Yeah. Okay. That's, all right. That's, I'm uh, not talking about my, this moment, but this is an question. important measure that we well, And it's an important yeah, yeah, time yeah. of year. You've got a lot of applications yeah. for yeah. seniors showing is, out. Mm -hmm. um, you've got my a lot of regents coming up. You've got your APs. Um, it's just a very crucial time um, in a high school. And it also creates a deficit with the person who's working with a sub that changes constantly because I'm assuming they probably have to spend so much time of their work talking to them about something they don't know how to do. Yeah. So, okay, any further discussion? No. John Merrow. I vote yes. I vote yes. John Cantone was a yes. Karen? Yes. Joanne? No. Myself, yes. The motion is carried. How many do we have? One, two, three, four, five. It's four, 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 four to four. one. Jeez. Thank you. Other business? Do we have I, other business before I the board? I have a question. Um, on all the new furniture that we've bought in the last five months, is there a dollar amount on how much we spent? And um, I did notice today up at the business office that um, one of the assistant superintendents got new furniture. And how much, did we go to the used furniture store or did we go to, to buy, buy it directly? I, I will so have how to get, much did that cost the I'll district? have to get you the information. I don't have it on right now. Because right, I, I we would buy like furniture. To all the time when we need to. What? We buy furniture all the time when we need to. I know, to. but we can also use the used furniture stores that have very nice furniture and we can get When it's them appropriate, we do. But um, many times it's nice not. Price. We also love getting donated furniture. So, um, I guess is I'd like to know how much we spent in, through the district in all three buildings plus that um, in the last well, four I, or five that's, months that's, on that's a little bit different. I'd need a, we'll, we'll have to talk offline on that. I mean, that's, that's a lot of accounting for what purpose? Well, I'd like to know how much money we spent. No, I understand that. And where all this money is coming from that we purchased from our budget. Furniture. Right. But when, we, when there was budget talk last year, um, nothing was presented saying that you were buying all this furniture, spending $100,000 or $50,000 or We didn't or spend $100,000 or we didn't spend $50,000. Um, we huh? buy budget, we buy budgeted, we use our budgeted numbers, dollars, excuse me, for purchases all day long, all day long. Is there a limit on what we spend? Yes, with the, the budget. Purchase agent? The budget. Oh. Well, the budget could be sixty million dollars. So let's spend all sixty million dollars. We spend ninety-two percent of our budget every year. Okay, so my question would be: Is every money that we get, you make sure you spend? No, we spend ninety-two percent of our budget. Okay. So again. So if we're spending all this money on things that somebody wants or whatever, it means that we're over budgeting our budget. We should be cutting our budget down at least 15 to 20 percent and spending okay. less money. We are going to start budget discussions very soon, so that yeah. should be part of our discussion. 
So th that was the information that I was looking to see how much money we have spent. Thank you. And you're going to come back with a 15 to 20 percent proposal? Hmm? You're going to come back with well, a 15 I, I to like 20 to percent because, proposal uh, well, with the detail the budget, about how we can do it? Uh, I would like to see how we can start cutting back and because the new capital project still does not include all the furniture. Where is all that money coming from? So if we the capital start cutting project back, will include furniture. Excuse me? The capital project includes furniture that we need. It does include all the gym equipment that we need yes. also? Because I was, we were sitting here and the architect said it did not cover all the furniture. The architect said, and we can pull it up if we need to, yes it does because he developed the budget and I have the budget in my office. Okay. So, <laughs> I now, just want to make sure it's not going to cost I would love to take donations money. if there's any groups out there that are interested in helping to defray some costs. We would love to take donations. Well, like I said, um, oh, my other question was, I had asked a question about um, the lacrosse program. Hmm? We were looking for numbers. Just, just out of curiosity, how much the new equipment cost us? Yeah, the uh, materials and equipment and supplies, things they needed for it, was about $6,000. That wasn't that bad. John took out of her existing budget. That wasn't bad at all. Okay. Right, yeah. That was actually yep. good. And that, that position will be on the, the next agenda to create the coach for the modified lacrosse program at the next. Did meeting. they find one? We haven't posted it yet because it's not created. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. It starts yeah. the beginning of March, so we need to cre it's time to create it. So. Is there a way that we could do that tonight? Budget neutral. Why don't, yeah, why don't we, let me put it on the personnel action sheet for next mm -hmm. time. So, I mean, we can, it's up to you, but. Yeah, let me put it on the personnel action sheet for next time. There's no reason to rush that. Okay, any other items? Okay, I would like to recognize District resident. Um, two things. Is it uh, not having looked at any of the numbers for the positions or whatever? Um, is it safe to say that state aid isn't always consistent and with the state of the state, there's a good possibility that the aid would go down, therefore making the two positions probably a better idea? Is that Perhaps. A One of the areas that the governor hits each budget and then ends up losing it in the long run is cutting BOCES aid, which is one of these aid areas. Okay, and the second thing is I think maybe the confusion, Joanne, with the equipment in the gym and the furniture, I think um, having sat through those presentations, I think what may be hanging you up is that he said that those, the pictures didn't necessarily represent exactly what was going to be in right. there, but that that was kind of a conceptual picture. So if they showed nine treadmills, that doesn't necessarily mean that the budget included nine treadmills, right. but that... That was kind of a concept of what it would look Correct, like. Correct, but there's other furniture that has to be bought. We have the music rooms that have to be filled. We have exactly. Uh, so that only, that right. furniture and would I, probably. I'm looking at if we cut some of the spending that we're spending now. The uh, the furniture could, would probably be under a budget item, so we would stick within the constraints of the not, budget. Right. That's not necessarily yes. true, because then if you're adding it to the budget, the budget's going up. Where are we adding to the budget? I'm well, confused. Well, that's the thing. We haven't gotten to the budget yet. Yeah, exactly. Correct. So I don't think we need to, I don't know, just saying. <laughs> well, like I said, I know there's people here that are struggling with their houses. Joanne. Absolutely. And, 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 and we passed a budget, and the superintendent that. is staying within the budget, correct? So I don't think that that needs to be something well, that's as contentious. That Joanne, so I have like consistency when I'm running these meetings because I don't want someone to think that I favor certain groups over others. We generally don't have back and forth discussion. Oh, okay. okay, that's Thank all I had to say. Uh, I just was clarifying sorry. some things as far as my understanding of how things are. <laughs> Any other items? Yes, can we uh, next time, can we ask Larry to put the heat on in the building, please? I made note of that. I'm really hot. Um, that, last time, too, but he, he it's, it's a town budget. Okay. 
I don't believe we have an executive session planned this evening, so if I can get a, a motion to adjourn. John, second. Karen, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Nope. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.